Dear Harstam, I hope this email finds you well, or at least better than the way this McTaren found me. Cherish the following replay I have sent you, because it is irrefutable proof that planetaries are OP and should be nerfed. I played my standard build against Terran, a safe start with Fast Expo, Phoenix to Charge Lot, and later Colossus. After we scouted each other, he saw my Phoenix Charge Lot comp and answered with a counter of Hellbat, Banshee and Cyclone. We had constant battles, trading our whole armies. He then went towards, which I scouted with my ops. Adapting, I switched to Mass Immortal, made three robos and pumped my upgrades to 3-1-3. Three, three. The game developed and we each took more and more expos and although I always had more bases than my enemy, it didn't really matter. He could turtle and mass whatever he wanted. I made DTs with Blink to snipe his bases, but it ended up backfiring because killing one planetary would set me back 8 DTs. Finally, my enemy went into battlecruisers with siege tanks. Having wasted all my money in fruitless attacks, I saw supply slowly crumble. Called GG out of respect and later sat down in my bathtub as cold water droplets merged with my tears. What am I supposed to do? Tempest? Switching all my tech and upgrades to air so late and down in bases seems impossible. What is the answer? The answer is nothing, because Terran is OP. I'm glad that the proof is out now, and you are our émissaire. Please let the world know. Best wishes and love, Golozo. A nice little rhyme there in the end. This imbalanced complaint form has a lot of poetic quality to it. Love the way this person wrote, Golozo, who is uh, not very happy with the Planetary Fortress, a Protoss player from the North American server, 3.5k MMR, and thus is in Diamond. And the question that he asked me is, are Planetary Fortresses imbalanced or do I suck? And we're here to answer that question. And in order to figure out the answer to that question, we need to look and study this game like it is the last thing we will ever do. To look at the build order, the unit movement, the unit counters, everything from start to finish. This stalker takes out the SEV, and the SEV does will not scout the fact that there's a Stargate here. This Stargate, for starters, is extremely late. The second gateway does not achieve anything, and this is one of these cases where it is very obvious to me that this player does not actually have a build order or understands how build orders work. Now, the reason why I say that is quite simple. Right now, we're seeing 150 minerals invested in a gateway that is not going to be used pre-warp gate. This gateway is going to finish 30 seconds before warp gate finishes up. And as there has not been constant production out of the single gateway, it makes no sense to add a fast second gateway, delaying your first tech structure, just to then start producing at that point. So I'm expecting no unit to be built from this gateway. Oh my god, you gotta be kidding me. He's actually gonna build a unit. Okay, well, this still doesn't make any sense because you delay your, your tech structure. You can just build three units pre-warp gate from a single gateway and have uh, this gateway still in time after the Stargate for your first warp in. This chrono is kind of useless as well, as I believe the unit would have popped like maybe a second after warp gate finishes up. So I think this is one of these build orders that he made himself and thinks is real cool and tight, but it actually looks quite bad. Phoenix is the first unit that is coming out. Chrono Boost on the Phoenix. Twilight Council is also going to be built here. And we see triple stalkers already out. We have some Chrono Boost on the probes. And then we see the probes not being consistently built. Thus the Chrono Boost isn't quite as useful. Not a huge fan of that. Um, I do like Chrono Boosting workers. Ooh, I also do not like this pylon, by the way. So there's a lot of things I don't like here in the early game. This pylon is what we call a slow warp-in pylon. So there's two types of pylon in the world. You have the slow warp-in pylons that are not in range ooh, there's a banshee out. that are not in range of a nexus and then you have the ones that are in range of a nexus or a gateway which can allow you to quickly warp in now, this banshee is going to take out a couple of workers the response was pretty slow there was a battery ready in the natural there was no battery uh, ready in the main which means that this opener also is extremely risky had the cloak banshee went gone towards the main base or if there were uh, mine drops with an armory present and thus there were invisible units this would have been a real issue. I do like the Oracle as a response to this, but this all could have just been scouted by having a faster Stargate, sending the first Phoenix across the map, and with that first Phoenix, figuring out what your opponent is doing. But because that second gateway got built before the Stargate, sending out the first Phoenix across the map actually ended up being pretty risky. So given the situation, 
I think Galozo did it somewhat okay. But the situation he was in should have never happened if his build order made any sense whatsoever. Command center is going to fly over towards the natural. We have double gases being taken in the natural. Now this is a, a telltale sign of mech play. Four gases going down at such high speed. Another very clear sign is the fact that there's a second factory. No tech lab on the barracks researching stim. So there's a lot of tells here. But for whatever reason, Goloso is forgetting to use the most important thing that you, that you get when you have a lot of air units, and that is scouting. You basically get free scouting. You don't need to send in hallucinations. Observers are not really necessary either because you can just fly a phoenix across the map. You can check what is being built. You can see which buildings are building something. So right now you fly in with a phoenix, you see, hey, a factory is building something and a starport with a tech lab is building something. And that would be extremely suspicious. Maybe you'd even be capable of getting uh, a quick peek on this second factory or so. And then you'd know, okay, there's two factories. This is going to be mech play. Against this type of play, especially with a fast third CC, you obviously are going to be needing a quick third nexus yourself in order to stay somewhat competitive uh, when it comes to the economy. However, Goloso is completely unaware of what is going on and now sends the only detection that he has across the map, despite his knowledge that there are banshees out. So I just kind of want to explain how you should be scouting here. If you have five units, okay, and you have four units that are exactly the same and that fulfill the same purpose, then you have one unit that is completely different and in this case serves a very specific purpose of being capable of detecting invisible units. And in this case, that would be the Banshees, as there are already three Banshees out. It would be way wiser to send over one of your Phoenixes not only because it's lower in value and faster, um, and thus if you lose it, it, it's harder to lose it, and if you lose it, it is less expensive, but also because this has a very vital role for the survival of your probes. If at right at this moment, three Banshees would fly in towards the main base where the cannon is just now starting, or they flew in towards the natural 10 seconds ago where this cannon isn't done yet, this oracle would have to be recalled and you would stay in the dark for even longer and on top of that would lose a bunch of extra workers that you wouldn't lose if you send a single phoenix across the map thus the move of scouting purely with the oracle makes no sense sending out a single phoenix is a completely fine way to do this if you have a group of units they don't always have to stick together you can separate them you can send one in you can have the three phoenixes and the oracle together and you'll be just fine I don't like that literally all of the air units are currently on the map. That means that there's no defense whatsoever currently at home. And that is usually quite bad, especially given that there is Banshees out on the map. And let's not forget that Goloso is aware that there are Banshees out on the map. He hasn't killed one yet. He has seen the fact that a Banshee took out like what, five workers, eight workers maybe even. Oh, that's a crap ton of workers. Where are you, Mr. Banshee? The one with the kills. I know what Banshee got some kills, no? I, th I think I clicked him at the end. Yeah, six kills. Six kills on this Banshee. Yeah. So it, it is just a little bit surprising to me that all of these air units are out on the map, knowing the fact that Banshees are alive. So at this point, we see uh, Goloso is scouting the fact that it's mech. And I'm really curious what the response is going to be. We see an Immortal being built here. We already have charge. The problem is that the eco is extremely bad. Just extremely, extremely bad. Terran is up 10 workers currently. And if Terran is up 10 workers, that usually is not a very good thing because add in the uh, efficiency of the mule, which doesn't count as a worker, it, it basically means that Terran is outmining you by like six, 700 minerals a minute here. And that is something that you don't really want, despite there being an even amount of bases currently. You see that? 2400 for the Terran, about 15, 1600 here for the Protoss player. Another thing here is that Protoss is mining a crap ton of gas. Uh, not completely saturated on the minerals yet in the natural either. We haven't seen a worker build in a while either. And I'm also not a, a, an actual huge fan of the current composition. And I'm going to explain that. So the thing with zealot compositions is that in order for them to be useful, you need to have a crap ton of them. Zealot, Archon, Immortal. You just need to have so many that you can just A, move into a position. You can quickly remax on that army as well with like 10, 12 gateways. Because Goloso opened up with a very technical type of opener with Phoenixes, uh, delayed third base, I'd much prefer seeing a disruptor approach here. Disruptors deal very well with mech armies that consist of Cyclones and Hellions and Hellbats. 
because these units they can't really kill the disruptors cyclones can't really get in range as long as there are no tanks out disruptors are the absolute king of the battlefield like there's nothing that beats that unit in the mech composition like literally nothing banshees can be taken out by the phoenixes as long as you don't fly over cyclones and you should be somewhat fine we still aren't seeing this huge influx of workers that we really would need to see uh, on add on top of that that um as we are playing against mech mech has like very limited tools of doing harassment and the harassment isn't what i would like to call uh, self-sustaining in a way it's not the correct word or the correct term but what i mean with this is that if the if the harassment finds any other uh, group of units on the map they can't really fight them they're really just good at killing workers so if you, for example, compare mech harassment with bio harassment, mech harassment consists of Hellions or maybe two or three Banshees. Now, if four Hellions find three Stalkers on the map, the Hellions most likely need to run. If you have two Medivacs filled with bio units and they find six Stalkers on the map, the Stalkers need to run. That means that as long as you have any amount of units on the map or even static structures, these will... Uh, as long as you have spotting of the harassment you should not really take any damage because everything kills the harassment unit of the mech army and that is one of the many weak points of mech is that their harassment and their ability to split the protos just isn't really there now this changes a little bit when the cyclones uh, come onto the map but a cyclone isn't really a ra an harassment tool it does allow for a bit of map control for the terran but it still isn't it's not really a unit you send in and you can pick up quickly in a medevac but it, it has the ability to fight but it doesn't have some of the other perks that bio harassment has for example you need a crap ton of cyclones and hellions for it to be good which means that splitting them up usually also comes at a price now given the fact that your eco is so extremely low and you're already down 80 supply i kind of want to say that this game right at this moment is over you have done nothing wrong enough nothing correct in the first 10 minutes and 30 seconds of this game and as a result the game has practically ended you're going to get a couple of lifts on these units but you're going to lose every single zealot against these helvets if the helvets decide to turn around or if these helvets have the pre-infernal reigniter or whatever it's called the blue flame hellion would also be kind of good now, there's no more uh, oracle available and thus all the banshees are going to take out the immortals I'm kind of surprised how well this fight went for you and it kind of shows once again how terrible literally any mech composition is like it really is just god awful i cannot believe how bad this fight went for your opponent i honestly would not have been capable of predicting that i really thought that with an 80 supply lead he surely was just going to absolutely uh, destroy you and doesn't quite seem to be the case you did lose your fort base and you're still extremely low eco you have negative map vision as well all you have is one observer over here what i would do in this type of scenario is i just get a pylon in this area i'd get a pylon in this area a pylon over here a pylon over here and a pylon over here and just like that you cover the entire map so whenever your opponent is attacking you you know that you're being attacked on top of that one of the things with mech especially when we're talking about tank mech is that they need to get into a position so if you know that they're coming for you and you can stop them from getting into that position that usually is quite helpful your army currently consists of what is it eight phoenixes no seven phoenixes two immortals and a colossi now the colossi don't really provide a lot of value in your army i don't believe i don't think they're necessarily great against cyclones they're not brilliant against uh, thor's eater and i don't think they're absolutely stunning at the, against tanks either so it's you have this you're building a lot of this one unit that i don't think really does too much for you your army also doesn't have a lot of um what should i call it synergy the phoenix is a unit that either needs to be used as a unit to kind of stop vikings from shooting your your colossi and then killing the vikings and going on top of the terran army very quickly the Colossi is a unit that, especially against Cyclones, wants to kite against Cyclones. Shoot once, move back. Shoot once, move back. Try to make sure that you don't, don't get locked onto, and that's it. The Immortal and the Archons are units that also want to fight immediately. So you kind of have this, this weird comp that doesn't really synergize together very well. Much rather would I have seen you, well, first of all, not continue Phoenix production, because you don't really need that many Phoenixes to deal with with these banshees you could just have four phoenixes five phoenixes 
and that's it. You'd be capable of dealing with the Banshees. Personally, I'd probably just trust on Stalkers, but if you really want Phoenixes, you can build a couple. You don't need continuous Phoenix production, because right now you're actually investing more in fighting the Banshees than your opponent is investing in building the Banshees. And don't forget that the moment that the Banshees die, your Phoenixes are useless. So this is one of these weird things where the Banshees are contributing to the main fight by killing a lot of units on your side or at least dealing a lot of damage but after you kill the banshees all you really can do is like lift a couple of cyclones but i don't even think you can quite do that now that there's so many tours out like your phoenix are just going to get absolutely blasted before they even get to that position so you're just in a relatively bad spot you're still completely blind as well you are getting a lot more workers i like that i appreciate the way that you're building your cannons as well making sure that uh, hellions that would run by or banshees that go behind your mineral line will not be having a grand time there uh, somehow some way you accidentally managed to to waddle into a somewhat correct position you're still not near your battery, which means that a super battery probably can't be used in this fight. Or if it can be used, well, the battery can just be targeted down as well. If your opponent, however, doesn't take it out, I would always recommend using the super battery here. Super battery is probably the most powerful defensive tool that Protoss has. And the fact that you're not using it while you're standing right next to it does sadden me a little bit. I believe that it heals 1400 shields over a relatively short period. So that is basically the health equivalent of, what is it? four archons maybe something along those lines yeah, actually four archons the shield equivalent of four archons doesn't really heal health so you get cleaned up and then your follow-up is to warp in eight dts the, the fight by the way i think if you do have the super battery would have gone a lot better i also think that the way you uh, you engage in general wasn't brilliant and the phoenixes probably should be coming in a little bit after the rest of your army and also should not be tanking all the Thor shots while they're completely clumped up. Because as a result of that, now the Banshees actually do stay alive. And if Banshees stay alive, they have a lot of damage output. You also lost your Observer, I think. Because you flew it into the Thors and the Raven was there. So that is all a little bit unfortunate and just a very poor engagement out of you. Once again, I would say that as long as there is no tank count that goes above 8 or 9... I truly do believe that Disruptors are the absolute king of these situations. Disruptors counter Tors, Disruptors counter Hellbats, Disruptors counter uh, Cyclones. They kill mines really quickly as well. As long as there's no tanks out, you can just keep adding Disruptors. And the moment tanks will get built, you can just transition into Tempest. No problem whatsoever. I'm also a little bit upset that you don't really have a massive eco despite playing against mech. You can really take a lot of bases and a lot of workers because the mech army fights so poorly and you can basically just do with a smaller army than you could against uh, maybe some other compositions. So this is not really how you would want to use DTs. You're kind of using your DTs here like they're zealots. And this is not something that I would ever recommend doing. Like if, you're, if you don't want to pay attention to your units, first of all, you should be playing Zerg. But if you don't want to be playing Zerg, get Zealots instead. DTs are extremely gas-heavy. Like they cost a crap ton of gas. They're more expensive than a Zealot as well. And if you don't know how to control them, which is not just leaving them there and A, moving into a base, I would not recommend building them. Or maybe just building one at a time, you know, because your opponent might not have detection. Don't send in five, because if they can deal with one, they can also usually deal with five. It's not about power, it's about uh, their invisibility. So if they have detection, they can usually deal with them. That's the case here as well. You just don't control them whatsoever, and you don't even have DT blink either. So despite this probably being good traits, I still much would have preferred these units just being like three zealots and one DT. So you still have like that bonus of there being an invisible unit, but it doesn't cost quite as much. Just a quick tip. Despite all of that, this actually was a good trade. I think it puts you in somewhat of a decent position as well. I just have to admit. Um, and you have way more workers. You have massive income. Just lacking in the gas a little bit for some reason. You're not mining yet from these two gases. You're not mining from this gas. Your main has ran out. And your third base is lacking one worker in one of the gases. So currently you're working off um, three gases and... 66 percent so three 3.66 gases which isn't great and it also kind of shows here 
Terran player, of course, with the, the mules also is kind of okay. So four orbital commands, despite there being very little workers, still has okay-ish income. I mean, it's not the greatest income in the world, but especially the gas count is, you know, a thousand gas a minute. It's actually quite a lot. You also have these mules landing. You have a non Ooh, second planetary coming in right now. It's actually kind of cool. So at this point, I think the, the tempo of the game kind of changes. You've been, despite your terrible start, you now find yourself in a position where I don't really want to say that you're ahead, but you're way in a way better spot relative to your opponent than you were like eight or nine minutes ago. So you're getting better and better position and also the tempo of the game changes. So rather than you just being the guy that sits back and takes the blows, I think right now you could be considering taking some map control again and maybe trying to poke in a base, at least figure out where your opponent's army is or what your opponent's army consists of because let's not forget you don't really have a clue you can say well i know there's a lot of tech labs and reactors on factories but this could be an army right now that consists of 25 tanks but it could also be an army that consists of five tanks 12 thors three ravens and five banshees which is what you're currently fighting against and both of these require a vastly different approach i actually really like this army if your opponent was playing a heavy tank composition. I think that would have been absolutely fantastic to have an army like that. You can tank with your Archons, you can come in with a big flank with the Zealots, and the Immortals deal just a crap ton of damage. But especially the Archons and the Immortals are a, a very vital uh, kind of uh, component against big tank armies. Against Thors and Banshees, however, and also a crap ton of Hellbats, I'm not entirely sure if this army works quite as well and i actually believe it doesn't against thors you have a beautiful unit once again called disruptor you can just send out a couple of disruptor shots and thors are really difficult to micro away because they're so darn slow so i'd recommend switching into that unit on top of that there's also a bunch of air units that you need to be dealing with and i actually wouldn't mind if you just add in a couple of tempests at this point already or if you want a couple of extra archons so you can deal with those couple of archons couple of blink stalkers also is a, a possible way to deal with it i do like that you've been building a crap ton of cannons all around the map or all around the bases um, that you have taken you still seem to be somewhat blind uh, to everything your opponent is doing but altogether this is a this is a very playable position if you would give this position to any pro player i think they'd be very happy with it. i mean you have a massive bank as well you have 11 gateways which is good and you have pretty decent upgrades too Okay, anti-armor missile gets hit. Uh. Okay, this I think was the worst fight you probably could have taken. Uh, it is really quite simple. When you engage into mech, you need to be sure that you can that you're gonna continue engaging into it. Now, I'm not saying that if you realize you're completely losing a fight that it's uh, it's better to lose everything and then just rebuild. No, I'm, what I'm trying to say is that if you are going to engage into Mac, in your head, you need to know that you're gonna pull a switch and that pulling out of a fight against Mac is going to be extremely expensive because the tanks are going to get a couple of extra shots. Your Most of your units are just kind of going to die as well uh, as they're running away from Thors who have decent range. So there is a cost to leaving the battle. So before the fight, you need to be very sure that you can go in and if you go in with your zealots behind your immortals and your archons and your immortals are doing the majority of the tanking against the hellbats and against the tank shots and against the tor shots that is not a good fight and you probably should not be going in against mech another thing is is that because they can't really chase you or they can't really go outside of their siege range you have a lot of time to set up engagement so there's no reason ever to rush into an engagement and thus there never should be a reason either to go into an engagement just to realize oh it's crap and then have to run out and take major losses which is what just happened here also when you realize your opponent's army is working better than your army is it's always a good decision to try to switch into something else even if you're not entirely sure what that is i think it often helps to if you're not completely uh, you know, if your fights are just not going well whatsoever, to just switch into a different unit that is very high tier. And in this case, like I said, that could be the Disruptor, but you could also try something like uh, just more Archons in this mix here, and I think that would work extremely well. Archons have insane tanking abilities, 
And if you get a good fight with a Zealot Archons around, you're often going to be in a fantastic spot. I like this move, by the way. I think this is actually a very good move. You go in to kill a planetary, kind of abusing the immobility of the mech army here, saying, okay, I'm gonna take out one of your bases. This is really fantastic. I also like the DT Blink. I actually think DT Blink against mech is not bad. Uh, mech is very immobile. They don't struggle with detection because usually there's a lot of turrets and there's a crap ton of command centers, but they do really struggle with mobility. And the moment mech moves out is usually when they're at their weakest. It also forces this, this type of siege up. Now you should probably split your army a little bit and there was stutter stepping that actually made the damage output worse in my mind. This is also a fight that you can't really continue into. And here comes another point that I always like to mention when talking about any situation that's when you're planning on actually attacking is to have a prism with you because prism allows you to have instant reinforcements in a fight and especially if you have a um, kind of like a backline in an army that is pretty bad in a one-on-one -on -one fight but is great as like a backup i mean immortals have insane damage output against armored units but they're not necessarily great at tanking uh, against thors and banshees or or hellbats that's kind of what your zealots are for. And then you have the second line of immortals. So just a single warp in of like, well, how many gates do you have? 11 zealots. I'm not saying it would have won you the game, but you probably would have been capable of taking out a lot of extra tours here and probably would have allowed you to keep a lot more of these immortals alive as well. Another quick note that I would like to make is now, this might sound very bad for Dutch people. And if you're Dutch, you might want to close your ears. But if the units are orange, this is not actually good for you. This is a bad thing. The orange indicator around units means that they have three less armor. This is the anti-armor missile of the Raven. And I know that well, as a Dutch person myself, you know, I like to dress up in orange as well and sing songs that no one else understands and that aren't really that good. But for whatever reason, loads of people sing them together during football matches and we wear orange clothes. So it feels worse, it feels bad, but I would still recommend at the moment your units are orange is to just move away temporarily until your units return to their normal color because they get their armor back in that case and these fights just become a lot easier. So for every single fight that you have had, kind of turned sour um, and part, part of that is because, uh, well, all of your units had minus three armor. That is about as impactful, well, that's just as impactful, I would like, I always like to mention this, as getting three armor upgrades. So. You're basically just, you know, that there's, there's a crap ton of resources that a single spell is worth. Uh, just something to keep in mind there. Now, your opponent starts going into BCs here. And this is one of the reasons why I also like to have slightly higher eco usually. I'm talking uh, 82, 83, 84, 85 workers. And uh, because it allows you to have transitions ready. Fleet Beacon, second, third, Stargate, all of that good jazz allows you to build a lot of cannons around the, uh, around the map as well. And in this case, it would have allowed you to immediately start Tempest production the moment you realize that battle cruisers are out. And now, despite you not knowing that battle cruisers are out, because once again, your scouting has been extremely subpar, I do believe that nah, this, nah, this starport with the tech lab, I guess. You can't really know that that's a battle group. It could also just be Banshees or more Ravens because your opponent has been building a lot of those. This is another reason why I like being aggressive against Mac and why a lot of people just like being aggressive and harassing in general is because the moment you do that, you get information automatically. Harassing is basically like scouting, except you're also dealing damage at the same time. Now, don't do this in real life. Don't harass people and tell them that you're scouting them out. That's a really weird thing to do and also highly illegal. This is StarCraft 2 advice, not real life advice. Um, five BCs are out already. Uh, plus two ship weapons upgrade as well. Yeah, you can just continue against BCs with having a pure ground army. It is possible against very low numbers of battle cruisers, but once there's like uh, 10 or 12 or 13 or 14 out, it usually isn't really viable. You can get a couple of stalkers at the start maybe to kind of catch the initial hit. Also, once again, anti-armor missile in combination with BCs is actually crazy because BCs attack so fast. Look at the damage output of BCs when the anti-armor is on is actually, actually insane. So this is the first time I just want to kind of just look at this again. This is the first time you really see the BCs. And the first thing you do after scouting that your opponent has six battle cruisers, sending in these DTs and warping in 11 more zealots. This is your response 
to seeing a flying unit is 11 more zealots and sacrificing your DTs into a planetary. I'm not even quite sure how this is possible. I feel like you tried microing them rather than just move commanding them in. And I'm like, oh crap, these 11 zealots are not actually that great against the, the battle cruisers, are they? Hmm. Maybe a void ray? Maybe more immortals? What do I do? No, 14 more zealots. Zealots are the counter to battle cruisers. And although I usually appreciate people uh, buying time if they don't have a counter ready, you do need to be buying time for something. If you're just building 14 zealots, sending them to their death and keeping your opponent's army busy while you're not transitioning into Tempest, you're just throwing away resources and immortals and units and actually giving your opponent more time to build more BCs. You can't just continuously be building more DTs and zealots and saying, okay, I'm just going to keep him busy forever and hope he never moves across the map. Like, unless you're actually actively taking out every single base that you attack and forcing your opponent home while you're killing crap tons of eco, as well as planetaries and, oh my god, how is it possible that it takes so long to get bases down? Are these blinks just bad? You have blink. I want to see this blink again. I just don't understand how it is possible that every single time you send in DTs that they don't deal damage, it feels like. Okay, so this is like 10, 11 DTs? It's 11 DTs, enough to three swipe a planetary. So you blink, and after your blink, four DTs are incapable of hitting the planetary. It would have just been better to right click it, because then the DTs automatically get to a position where they can hit it, and you also don't have the half a second cooldown that you had right now. Still, no transition available whatsoever. After sending in nine, after sending in eleven DTs and losing like four of them to one planetary, this time it was decided to send in four into two planetaries, and then we were surprised that that didn't work and we lost every single DT. Another warp in of zealots, of course. It didn't work the last seven times. They still can't shoot up, but maybe warp in another fourteen, and then these eight battle cruisers. Surely at some point, these zealots will adapt or evolve you know, on, on the original species over here freaking uh darwin it's like surely after all the zealots realize that they can't attack up and that is not very good for their survival chances eventually they will naturally morph into stalkers four more ah that's to deal with a tank no i take that back these four were good he dealt with a tank with it still have no transition ready he, <laughs> he mentioned something about this as well. He said, what am I supposed to do? Tempest? Switching all my tech and upgrades to air so late and down in bases seems impossible. What is the answer? Well, even if you don't know what the answer is, I think we have sufficient proof at this point that building more zealots and immortals is not the way. So no matter what you do, that should not be the way moving forward. However, you once again queue up three more immortals, despite you losing, what was it, like four immortals over here? Was it over here? I can't even recall where it was anymore. Just remember seeing four immortals die in the BCs. Ah, it was in this area. After the Zealot run by that field as well. Archons are not a terrible call, but also not a very good call. They're not actually that great at killing BCs, but they can tank a fair amount of damage. And a unit that actually is quite good against species is a sentry just a single one for the guardian shield because it gives your units two more armor and against units that have such a high rate of fire as the battle cruiser that could be very useful however in this type of scenario i really once again must stress that a tempest is going to be the correct call tempest are the hard counter to battle cruisers tempest plus oracle you can revelate the pcs and then you can attack them it's kind of weird as well to say well Switching my upgrades in the late game to all air is so difficult. It's like, yeah, I know it's difficult, but your opponent did the exact same thing. Like, if, you're, if you're in the Olympics and you're doing the high jump and the guy before you jumps over like six meters and 50 centimeters and you so far have only jumped over six meters and 40, you can't just say, well, um, I kind of want to try six meters and, and 40 centimeters again. Because you'll never beat your opponent then. You need to at some point jump higher. You can't just be like, well, it's very difficult. And so I'm not going to do it. 
like you can do it like that but you're just going to lose every single time then this is how the game works like it's also difficult at the start of the game to imagine that you're eventually going to have a maxed out army but if your opponent is maxing out you can't say well i don't feel comfortable going to max that sounds very expensive i'm just going to stay at 90 supplies like well you're just going to lose the game and it's the same here your opponent has tech and it requires a counter you can't just say that it's difficult and not do it that's not how life works well no, no that actually isn't how life works i was thinking of a scenario where this is how life works but it isn't there it literally doesn't work like that like you just have to quit then like if something is too difficult and you can't do it then you have to quit but you can't complain if the other people are doing it and they're better than you it's like it just doesn't work like that i kind of like this move honestly despite it's probably gonna go horribly wrong i like the fact that you you realized that the army was too big for you to attack and you went for a base with an army that could very quickly kill a base i think that's actually a good move now i don't think this base should have been attacked but imagine that this army rather than attacking the middle where the terran army was would have moved towards the right side and just started taking out these bases then you're doing two brilliant things at the same time one you're forcing your opponent to chase your army and two you're actually creating an army that eventually maybe can take on the terran army because this is an army that actually has some potential the archons for the tanking a little bit of anti-air as well they're quite good against tanks because of the tanking ability once again um, and it's still relatively mobile that you can run away against big tank lines so you just have all these perks in this army if you start taking out bases on the right side and you start warping in like a crap ton of stalkers here to deal with these uh, battle cruisers eventually or you finally start tacking into the into the tempest and add a couple of disruptors in there i really like this army and i even like the idea of killing this planetary i think it's a it's good and you also see that if you have a really big army you can actually take out a planetary fortress like it doesn't actually put up much of a fight like the repair is nice but immortals just completely destroy this type of building once again disruptor i'm just going to keep mentioning the disruptor again and again and again because against planetary is also super useful it can deal a lot of damage to planetaries and it kills the SEVs at the same time so you're going to get a gg well played and you leave the game i appreciate that you did that but i just have a lot of problems with how you played this game and how you kind of perceive certain things happening and how you believe the game should be played i just don't quite understand it first of all your opener you mention it as what did you say i played my standard build against Terran, a safe start with a fast expo now i love it when people have a thing that they enjoy doing like a safe build in in any matchup but there needs to be some level of flexibility in the build and if you get a very fast gateway which delays your scout and thus doesn't allow for any flexibility in the early phases of the build you get into a situation where at like the nine minute mark you're down 80 supply and your opponent is pushing you with a massive mech army that is a bad situation if that hadn't had happened then you would have taken a faster third base maybe delayed some of your extra gateways because honestly your opponent wasn't gonna attack you in the first six minutes with anything big you probably would have been in a way better spot than maybe you would have been capable of having more map control in the mid game and taking out extra bases on the side so not a huge fan of your entire early game and how little flexible you are in that type of case on top of that your your process of dealing with army compositions that you are not familiar with or you didn't know how to beat i think is kind of bad you just basically pick the immortal and the zealot as a unit and then stuck with it the entire way through despite it not really working in well some of the bigger fights and i think that is an issue you need to be capable in the game if you're fighting a composition that you haven't seen before to kind of realize when fights aren't going your way i'm not telling you to throw the basically everything away so like if zealot immortal doesn't work like, okay zealot immortal crap but you and, and you completely tech switch into i don't know like mass phoenix and that doesn't work you throw out the phoenix and you go into mass stalker no you can make small changes in an army and in this case just adding archons would have helped so so much for your tanking power and also just the the, the, the anti-air damage output that you would have had naturally had especially the the fight near i think it was your third base where the banshee stayed alive like having a couple of archons there would have been great or just a couple of stalkers rather than the phoenixes um and then you talked about dts with blink to snipe his bases and it ended up backfiring i i think it 
you at that point you were down 80 90 supply when you really started going for that dts are a luxury unit in a way this is a unit that you can build if you are maxed out you have a pretty decent bank and your opponent wants to be active on the map or has too many bases for him to attend to so it's a, a late game unit when both of you are very rich most of the time it's a very good unit because you can just blink on top you three shot a planetary and you can walk away the way that you use dts at the start was you would send them in like zealots and they would die and you did this when you weren't so rich yet then at the end of the game you did it again when you weren't rich whatsoever you would just throw them away and you would take out a base but at that point your opponent was already kind of out mining you so there was no point anymore the, the the main purpose of the dt is that it can stay alive and kill bases quickly you lost all of your dts every single time um and also you somehow managed to make them kill bases slow which is impressive because the DT just has a lot of damage output. And your blinks were very debatable there. Um, the planetaries thus weren't really the issue, I think. The main issue in this game that I saw for you was the army compositions that you had, especially once the battle cruisers came out. You worked in like 60 extra zealots and built like six or seven extra immortals, despite none of these units having a, a reliable anti-air attack or an anti-air attack whatsoever to speak of. So yeah. Planetaries, my friend, are not in balance, but it is you instead who sucks. That's going to be it for me today. Thanks all so much for watching. I hope you did enjoy this episode of Is It Immo or Do I Suck? If you did, don't forget to hit the like button. Subscribe to the channel. I'll see all of you next time for a new video. Thank you and bye bye.